Niil on mees, kes on teinud Eestile peale vähemalt seitse ringi. Niil on mees, kes tänu kellele ilmub ainult Eestit kajasta vinglise keelne ainus reisijuht. Järgmisel aastal peaks siis loodetavasti ilmama seitsmes trükk sellest reisijuhist. Niil on kohe kohe minemas järjekordsele tuurile mööda Eestit, et viimase kolme nelja aasta uuendused oma raamatusse kirja panna ja neid uuendusi on väga palju. Hästi hea meel on selle üle. Niil on ka mees, kelle üle me naabrid on meile kadedad. Meil oli veebruari kuus Londonis workshop ja meie hea sõber Suurbritannia Soomet esindav prouva ütles just, et kadeda pilguga, aga teil on ju Niil. Nii et mul on hästi, hästi hea meel, et Niil on täna siin, kui mina Niiliga koht on, siis mul on alati tunne, et ma ei tea Eestis nagu eriti midagi, aga teil on nüüd võimalus teda kuulata ja tema käest kõike küsida. Niil, I praised you, so now it's your turn, please. Very nice. Yes, this is working. Good. I'm not a technical person, so, but if I see a light on, I hope you can hear me. So, well, Estonia has been part of my life since the re-establishment of independence here. I first came in early 1992 and brought the first group in September 1992. I was, of course, with Regent Holidays, as uh, Christina was saying, and since I left Regent Holidays, I've been running a British Estonian Association. I've been writing my guidebook. I'm now preparing the seventh edition of this book. This is the sixth edition, and the next edition will come out next year. And I suppose my mission with this book is really to um, ensure that people just come to Estonia. Christina was just mentioning that uh, a lot of people Estonia is still on a Baltic state, not even a Baltic country, and we all have to work at making sure that Estonia is seen as a destination in its own right, that uh, people come just to Estonia if possible, and not visit other countries here, or not visit um, too many other countries whilst they're on their tour to Estonia. And Estonia is certainly part of my life now, um, I married my long-term Estonian partner uh, last summer on the roof of Kumu. So if any of you are <laughs> planning marriages or know friends who are, I can certainly recommend the roof of Kumu for your marriage, <laughs> provided it's sunny, and that's uh, important. But you can get married in the big lift um, if uh, you can't get married on the roof. So um, that's something for some of the younger people here to think about, or your younger friends. Well, Christina has talked about um, Andros II, the British market, about people living in Britain. I wanted to start with British people who are not living in Britain. I come, of course, to Tallinn many times a year, and I meet British people who are living here. They may have an Estonian partner and divide their lives between Britain and Estonia. They may be working here for a number of years, but a lot of them do not know Estonia. They perhaps have been to Sarema for three days, perhaps they've been to Tartu. If they have business here, they go to a factory or they go to a conference, but they do not get to know the country. The ignorance amongst British people here and amongst other foreigners of Estonia is extraordinary. So collectively, there is a task to be done of approaching the foreigners in Tallinn, not just, of course, the British people, and selling Estonia. Now, many of you are selling, of course, in Estonian to Estonian people who can afford your products. 
but I'm not really aware of Estonian companies selling enough to the foreign community. Now, it's too technical to discuss how you should reach them here in Tallinn, because of course most of them are in Tallinn, but there is a rich market here. Stina and Andros have talked about the complications of the market in Britain, and I will say a little bit more about that. But there are several hundred British people here, and several hundred people from other nationalities who can be reached in English, for whom English is their second language. And to be blunt, they are very rich, and you have to stop them going to Helsinki, stop them going to Riga, stop them going back to London, and keep them here in Estonia. So do consider those who are in Tallinn. In a way, equally important are the British people living in St. Petersburg, which is nearby. Now, British people living in St. Petersburg hate it. They hate anything to do with Russia. Um, they hate, they are only there to earn a lot of money. They don't learn Russian. They're not interested in Russian culture. They count the days until they can go back home. Now, those are an ideal market for you here in Estonia. Why should they fly back to London when they can come and have a Western holiday with you? They can drive two or three hours to be with you, whether those of you, doesn't matter whether you're running a manor house, whether you're running a hotel, whether you're running an attraction. For British people in St. Petersburg, you are providing what they want. They want a Western holiday because they hate life in Russia. Now, in Moscow, there is a similar community, but of course, it's not so easy to get here as from St. Petersburg, but there is a market there. And in both those towns, there are thousands of other foreigners who hate Russia just as much as the British do. I can give you the history of that, but that isn't relevant. Just assume that there are rich people there who hate Russia and will love Estonia because of the product that you provide, because it is a complete contrast to the life they are leading in Russia at the moment. And that isn't going to change over the next few years. Perhaps relations between Russia and Britain get a little better, get a little worse. But I can predict that over the next five or ten years, there will be that market for you which needs to be tapped. Um, and in fact, um, Andrea, who succeeded me as the director of Region Holidays, she spent several years in Kiev running a travel agency in the 1990s for foreigners living in Kiev. And she said they would come into her office on a Tuesday, Wednesday, they said, I want to leave this place where they spoke in much cruder language than that, which I won't repeat. Um, uh, but the meaning was they wanted to leave as quickly as possible for a weekend uh, or for longer if they had the time. And I don't know how British people are finding Kiev now. I think probably they're more tolerant than they were in the 1990s and the hostilities in Moscow and St. Petersburg. But her travel agency lived off foreigners who were unhappy in Kiev. Well, the successors to the business she was running there are now in St. Petersburg and in Moscow, so do try to reach them and reach the other foreigners there as well. Similarly, one can say there are British people in Riga, Helsinki, Stockholm. No, they're not unhappy living there. The situation is totally different. They are very pleased to be living there, but they should be visiting Estonia. If they're nearby, they should not be going home. And in a way, I suppose, you have the job of saying, well, don't go up to northern Finland, just cross over and come and see us here in Tallinn. Or in Riga, well, don't go to Latgale, don't go to Zemgale, don't go to Vilnius, please come up to uh, Tallinn, come up to Tartu. So there are foreign communities there, whom the British are quite a large <coughs> number, and they need to be reached as well. So um, do try uh, with those markets, with the foreigners there who would enjoy Estonia. And um, they will have a very pleasant time here. And that is a sort of new market, I think, for you all to consider.
Well, now I will talk about um, the British in Britain. Um, both Andres and Christina have made several points on that. The point I would emphasize is how rich in Estonian terms people between 55 and 75 are. I'm in that generation myself. We are the lucky generation. I won't give you an economic history of Britain, that's not my job today, but we are lucky in that we are richer than the next generation will be and the much older generation. So Christina gave you the figure of £1,100 that they are on the whole spending for a holiday and the extra amount of money that they have. And this is convenient for many of you because you have the products that this sort of generation wants. They want high standards, they don't want deluxe accommodation, and they will buy lots of extras. Um, they are therefore ones to whom you can sell car hire, and car hire um, is obviously lucrative because people don't hire a car for one day, they will hire it for three or four days, and often for a week you can uh, sell it for a sort of longer time. Um, and it's important, I think, to stress, as uh, Christine and Andrews have done, there are lots of markets in Britain that are of no interest to you. The family market has been mentioned, backpackers have been mentioned, and in a sense, even almost the city break market is less important because you cannot make so much money out of it. So the task is to reach these rich people, um, this money is stable, they're not suddenly going to be poor next year, most of them have finished their job, so they're not worried about whether they will have a job next year, so they are a very stable market for you to attract, um, and one to sort of work on, and even if it does take time to reach them, they will still be there, so if they think about Estonia this year, um, they may only come in 2015, but they will have the money to come in 2015 and it doesn't matter whether the pound is worth a little bit more against the euro or a little bit less, they still have the money to come. And from the tour operator point of view, um, the tour operators who come here, they are of course stable too. They have been working like Regent for many years. Regent has worked longer than the others. Um, but they will have the specialist knowledge, they have the interest, and they will treat you as better business partners. They won't argue all the time about money because that isn't necessary. Um, a lot of big British tour operators are selling holidays at £99 or £199 and are cutting costs everywhere and will say, well, can we not have coffee or something and save a pound here or a pound there? Well, luckily, um, tour operating from Britain to Estonia doesn't need to operate on that basis. There is money there both for the tour operator in Britain and for you. The prices have to be sensible, but um, there is profit to be made at both ends, in, in Britain and in here. Well, what is it that interests British people when they come here? Um, well, I've got an unusual choice of attractions. Um, in a sense, it's a little irrational. Uh, it's what interested me and what I wrote about in my guidebook. It's what's come about from talking to friends and some clients who've uh, been to these different places. But aspects of Estonia that I think are worth promoting. Well, the first item that I have noted are the borders, the frontiers. Now, Britain, we don't have borders. We've got the sea, and nowadays with the border to Ireland, very, people, very few people know about and has always been very open. And of course, the English-speaking market, in a way, includes the United States and Australia, Canada. Well, most people coming from there have never seen a frontier. Now this is an attraction in Estonia in two or three very particular places. Um, I take groups, um, particularly if they're going on to Latvia, I always stop in Volga. Well, Volga, when I talk to Estonians about Volga, they say, well, there's nothing there, what's the point? 
And I say, well, um, it is an amazing place to show to foreigners. There is a particular British interest because the person who fixed the border between Estonia and Latvia was a British person. He had a colourful history when he came back to Britain in the 1920s. Um, he brought a business sense to the post office. He was a governor of the BBC, did all sorts of different things in Britain. So his uh, history is of interest to the British tourists there. But there's nowhere else in Europe where you find a small town with people speaking four languages. The sadness of having, I think, is it 12 cemeteries and explaining to people why there are so many different cemeteries. Uh, the German military cemeteries, the Jewish cemeteries, the Soviet cemeteries, the Latvian cemeteries, the Estonian cemeteries, um, all a very strange concept for British. Just for the quality of the... Oh, sorry, am I... All right. Yes. Behind. Good. Thank you. Is that? No, that is clear, is it? Good. Thank you. Um, uh, and other things about Valga, I didn't expect to find a Korean restaurant there, um, but the tourists find that um, very interesting. And to some extent, it's a pity that the border doesn't literally go through the town anymore. Um, but nonetheless, people have this extraordinary sensation that they drive or walk 200 meters and suddenly a different language and for the next six or seven months a different money and that will probably change next January when the Latvians adopt the euro but uh, this is something that is very special now if I talk about other attractions in Estonia we can talk about stately homes we can talk about castles we can talk about narrow streets and so on where you have lots of competitors for that, but you don't have a competitor for um, Volga. And if I may talk about one attraction in Latvia, it's only 200 yards from the border, um, that is the defence installation where the Soviet high command was going to go in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, most clients who come to Estonia who are over 60 years old, they will remember the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 when we were close to a nuclear war. I certainly remember it at school and wondered, well, is there any point in doing homework if we're going to be destroyed in 24 hours? Well, anyway, where the Soviet military hierarchy was going to retreat was in Volka, and one could see the bunker where they were going to direct uh, the nuclear war from. So again, you don't expect to be going through the gentle Estonian countryside and then suddenly you cross the border and you see that. So a whole range of things in Volga, which is why some people say, why are you writing about six or seven pages on Volga in your book? And I say, because it's full of things that you can't see anywhere else. The other thing I suggest that um, tourists should do is drive to Satse. Now, I don't know how many of you have done that drive. Um, there are quite a few Estonians who haven't heard of Satse, and of course very few have been there. But that you actually drive through Russia twice in a drive of about an hour is quite extraordinary. And if you're a foreigner who hasn't read the map in detail, you don't even know you're crossing Russia, into Russia. The road changes in its quality. You perhaps see a sign which says uh, you shouldn't cycle and you shouldn't walk. Um, you may not notice those. But anyway, to sort of promote this as something quite extraordinary that you drive into Russia, well, first of all, for what, about one minute, and then 10 kilometers down the road for about three minutes. Well, where else in Europe are you offered an extraordinary experience like that? Um, I don't think anywhere. So I promote that as something which is absolutely um, unique in Estonia. And then, of course, when you get to Satse, you have the experience that older people like myself remember from Germany when it was divided. Um, tourists of course went to the Berlin Wall or they saw the division between West Germany and East Germany and the watchtowers and the barbed wire things like that um, well that disappeared from Germany in 1989 it came to Estonia in uh, 1991 um, and that is of interest to tourists just to walk 
20 meters from these um, almost saying Soviet border guards, I mean Russian border guards. Um, an extraordinary experience and uh, my friends who've been down there sort of talk about it uh, years later. They don't talk about Tallinn, they don't talk about Tartu, they talk about this extraordinary experience um, of visiting uh, Satse. And I gather the museum has been renovated. I'm going to see it next week, so probably I will write more about the museum there in um, my next book, because that has been renovated, and therefore a sort of extra attraction for going there. Well, now um, a more conventional um, attraction, uh, the car hire, um, which has been mentioned. I've discussed it as something lucrative. Well, why is that of interest to these older British people? Well, I'm old enough to remember in Britain when my parents were driving me, I was too young to drive at the time, when if we wanted to go somewhere, we drove in the car uh, and we parked the car where we wanted to stop. We parked it outside a church, we parked it outside a zoo or whatever we were going to see, and 50 years ago in Britain, that was normal. Well, that is still possible in Estonia. So for older tourists, there is this real appeal of being able to drive a car and have no frustrations when you drive the car. Um, in Britain, driving is horrible. You drive because you have to, um, because there isn't a bus or there isn't a train, or you wonder, well, where can I park? Or if I park in the car park, is it terribly expensive? Well, as long as you're driving outside Tallinn and outside central Tartu, it is a real pleasure to drive in this country. And that is something worth promoting, that you don't have the costs of parking the car. And you can also work out, usually, within five or 10 minutes, how long a drive is going to take. Yes, the roads are sometimes being repaired. There's a remont, that dreadful Russian word that's coming to Estonian. But compared to Britain, I mean, Christina will know more than I do now between coming from London and Bristol, how long it can take. I mean, when I was doing that drive, if I was doing it late at night and was lucky, perhaps I did it in two hours. But if it was in the morning or the evening, perhaps it takes four hours, you, you never know. And so you arrive for an appointment an hour early or an hour late. Well, things like that just don't happen in Estonia. And it's something really to promote that you've got the excellent roads. Um, the distances, of course, are not very long. So petrol costs are not going to be that high. But this privilege is something that probably no other country in, in um, West in Europe can offer. I don't know Eastern Europe well enough to judge other countries, but the roads in Latvia and in Lithuania are not so good. And also, there are not so many attractions close to one another. I mean, normally you can drive 20 kilometers in Estonia and there is something to see. Um, but often in other countries, you might have to drive 50 kilometers between something to see. So. The car driving is, is a pleasure here, is worth promoting, and of course is profitable to all of you. It's profitable to Christina to start with uh, selling car hire in Britain. And even those of you, most of you of course, are not actually selling car hire, but you can benefit from the tourists who can drive to your manor house, drive to your museum, park close to your hotel. And of course, if they're hiring a car for a long time, they will be using services which many of you are providing. They're not just going to use one service, so they will be in different hotels, they will visit different museums, see other attractions, and spend money, of course, um, in a number of different uh, restaurants. So car hire is definitely um, worth promoting. The other thing which, in a sense, you might think is a contradiction, um, is public transport. Um, and it isn't a contradiction because, as Christina has pointed out, uh, people coming from other countries for various reasons might not want to hire a car or combine it or are particularly interested in trams and trains. Now, I bring deluxe tourists uh, quite often to Estonia, so uh, they stay in the four or five-star hotels, obviously coaches and so on. 
but um, because my flat here in Tallinn is in Kadriog at the end of the tram route, um, I usually have a sort of reception for them in the flat, uh, so it's 15, 20 people, so they come to the flat, we've say, been to the palace or been to Kumu, um, and then we go back on the tram. Now, these are people who normally one would think, well, they will want a taxi or we should keep the coach, and I always offer them a taxi. I say, well, I can order a taxi, or would you like to take the tram? They'll say, gosh, wonderful, the tram. Haven't been in a tram for 40 years because there haven't been trams in Britain since the 1960s. So the trams are a major tourist attraction, and in other towns that have them, I mean, there aren't trams elsewhere in Estonia, but um, trolleybuses, of course, here too, they are an attraction um, because they are unusual. There are, I think, none in Britain um, and not many in <coughs> other countries. Uh, and of course, for people who do not have cars, the bus service is good in Estonia for linking up all of you in a way, or most of you, um, if there's a bus route uh, fairly near you. Um, Rukla is lucky with a train service that's still, I gather, reasonable, um, but most other places is travel, of course, by bus. Um, my sort of criticism here is that there isn't any encouragement to tourists to travel by bus around the country, and it is a service that can actually be advertised. Um, the comfort is now reasonable, the frequency is now reasonable, and if you're as old as I am on a Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, the prices are very reasonable indeed. Um, I travel to Taktu now in the middle of the week for five and a half euros, and uh, I suppose I could put well, Piano is about three, so the cost is very low for um, people coming from Western Europe. And what is missing is this encouragement. And of course, if people were encouraged to stay in Estonia buying a ticket on the buses for a week or for even for two weeks, they would stay longer and then travel visiting all your different attractions or hotels. Um, and those of you who've traveled in many other countries, you will probably have been offered, you've taken advantage of course having a week's ticket, it might be on the buses, it might be on the trains, um, used to be on planes but not anymore now, but at least on buses and on trains and that is something that is missing in Estonia. It would be very nice to have a car that could be sold through the travel trade, well equivalent to the Tallinn um, bus cards for one day or 72 hours, if one could extend that concept and have a ticket covering the bus routes in Estonia, that would be um, of great interest um, and more people would use the buses and would travel around. And What happens of course elsewhere is that the rail or the bus companies sell that through the travel trade so there would be commission for those of you who are travel agents here and in turn, of course, it would make money for region holidays and other operators abroad. Another attraction are what I call the accessible islands. I say accessible, that means you can reach them easily because you can. The boat to Hiyuma, in particular to Saremar above all, does not take long and is not particularly expensive. And I have to contrast this with the situation in Britain where getting to the islands which are mostly off the coast of Scotland is very complicated. Some you have to fly, the boats are expensive and when you get there um, everything that you buy is terribly expensive because it's all been imported usually from the south of England. So it's a luxury holiday visiting islands in Britain. It is not fortunately visiting the islands in Estonia. And the advantage in particular of Saremar is that if you go there, you're going to stay quite a long time. You're not going to go there and spend one night. So again, you sell the car hire for longer, the hotel stays are longer, the variety of attractions lead to a much longer holiday. And it's a sort of product almost in its own right. But you do now have the islands, of course, in the Tallinn Bay, which were closed in uh, the Soviet period, and as an extra in Tallinn, I think Nysa is invaluable. 
think what this small island offers, um, I suppose for most of you, you're interested in the concerts in the evening, and those of you who are selling packages in Tallinn, you sell the coach, the boat, the concert, the dinner, and then people come back and so on. Well, for British people, what else is there on NISA? There are, of course, not just one railway, but several railways. And one railway specialist has actually said it has the highest concentration of narrow gauge railways in the world because there are the s several railways on this small island and again for foreigners this is fascinating um, you don't expect a narrow gauge railway on a small island well there it is what else do you not expect on this small island you don't expect to be told that the first cricket match, and cricket is a game we play in Britain, the Australians play it, the Americans and the Canadians don't, but uh, it's a game we take very seriously, I suppose it's like Americans and baseball, we all have to know about it and follow it and so on. Well anyway, the first cricket match in Estonia took place on Nysa Island when British troops were fighting the Russians in the Crimean War, but had time for other things as well, because the Russians, that was a war the Russians lost, not a war that the Russians won. So there was plenty of time for cricket and um, the British tourists are interested in that. And there is also yet another cemetery with British people buried there, but one or two of the soldiers and sailors um, who were killed. So think about the islands as something which of course Estonia has, and again in competition with your neighbours, um, they hardly have them. Uh, Latvia doesn't have an island at all, of course they're very angry about that, but uh, it's something you can use um, in competition with them. Finland has a few, but quite complicated to get to. Sweden has a few, uh, expensive and difficult to get to. So the contrast with Estonia in that respect. Um, now the um, special interest groups. Well, I think this has been covered by Christina and Andrew, so I won't talk too much about that. But when I was at Regent Holidays, certainly my failure was not bringing a school group from Britain here. And schools do travel. Um, and I would hope that they can be encouraged. Tends to be a sort of haphazard contact. Perhaps a teacher happens to have liked their holiday here or knows an Estonian or some reason like that for wanting to travel here. So that is something to work on. What the travel trade seems to miss out on a lot are choirs coming here. I get to hear after they have been that a choir has come from a church in Britain. It sang usually just in Tallinn for one night and then they flew back to Britain. And I hear about this usually when they've been, as I say, well, the travel trade in Estonia and in Britain somehow is not getting into that market. Um, some of them genuinely, if they all have jobs and can't go away for a long period of time, perhaps they can only come for one or two nights. But it would seem that there would be scope to, well, encourage other choirs. And of course, if they come, not just to sing in Tallinn, but to find other towns where they should sing as well. And of course, to have a longer tour. And I mean, Estonia is famous for its music. Andrus was saying whatever percentage of the British population hasn't heard of Estonia, well, they haven't heard of Estonians, but uh, amongst the sort of travellers we're attracting, if you said to them, name an Estonian, well, they would name Arvo Peart because Estonia is famous for music, uh, and he has come to Britain quite a lot, um, and his music is, is played in Britain. So um, there should be more musical links, um, which the travel trade um, does need to get into. Well, as usual, I'm talking much too long. I will um, uh, try and be a little quicker. Um, I have to be negative on some things. Um, we're talking amongst friends here. Um, it's 20 years since the Soviet Union has gone, and we all had to pretend that everything was perfect and nothing was wrong. Well, what is wrong in Estonia? What do the clients not like? Again, I'm talking about my age group because that's the group that brings in the money and uh, you need to target. Well, what do we hate? It's mu The first thing is music in restaurants. Um, now, this isn't 
only an Estonian problem, it's a problem in many places. Um, you know, when I go out in London or somewhere, we always have to think now, do they play music there or not? And we will go to places which do not play music. Now I hope in the next edition of my book to be able to publicise restaurants that do not play music. I'd be delighted, I'd give a whole page on one restaurant. So if any of you are running restaurants or if you are in a hotel um, where there isn't music, um, I will give you tremendous publicity. And coming back to what Christina was saying about, well, a quirk, something that public relations companies in Britain could uh, publicise, would be a restaurant that does not play music. Now, I bring the deluxe groups I was telling you about. Um, when I book meals, we say there is to be no music. Um, and the restaurants will sometimes say, well, we want 20 people, OK. We will turn off the music whilst you are there. Some will say, oh, this is impossible. And then, well, we just don't go there, um, because that is a stipulation of the company. They run 200 groups all over the world, and wherever they have dinner, there is not to be music playing in the restaurant, because the clients are between 55 and 70. They want to talk to each other. If they want to listen to music, they want to choose the music. We can turn on the radio, we can go to a concert, um, we can listen through our sort of computer equipment, uh, and so on. Um, we don't want pop music imposed by a restaurant. So I hope that uh, some restaurants in Estonia will cater for these clients. What sometimes happens is that if I'm eating on my own with these clients when we've got free evenings, um, we will go out and we will say, well, the music's very nice, the prices are very nice, but we've got this ghastly music, we're not going to stay, so perhaps we have the soup and the main course and don't stay for a sweet. Or we say, well, we're not going to have coffee here, this music's just gone on too long, we'll just make coffee in our own room. So quite a few restaurants are not making money out of older people. It's these older people who are going to be buying wine and not beer, who might have a drink after dinner as well as coffee and so on. They're not counting the pennies um, and they need encouragement in restaurants and they don't have it. Um, now museums, uh, Christina was mentioning the problem with agents that um, responses are needed on Saturday and national holidays and so on because the clients expect that. Well, we have a similar problem with museums that they tend to open to suit the staff and not to suit the clients. Um, now, I go to museums when I'm preparing my book. I travel around the country this sort of time when the autumn, obviously not the busy time because um, people don't want to see me in the height of summer when the tourists are there. Um, but I will often go to museums earlier that are sort of empty at this time of year and I think well is it really necessary to open but then I might be with a group over the Easter weekend or over midsummer um, August the 21st which of course no non-Estonian is expecting a holiday on August the 21st and the museums are closed now museums are like any other attraction they're like a hotel or a restaurant or well, those of you who are guides, you have to fit in with the clients. So if you're a guide and a flight arrives at 6 o'clock in the morning, you get out of bed at 5 o'clock in the morning and go to the airport or whatever. But the museums, no. I mean, they suit the staff who want to have a day or two off a week uh, each week, who like to work perhaps between 11 and 5 and not really in the evenings. Well, that simply is not good enough um, for tourists. Um, and I always quote an example of Scotland that the museums close completely in the winter because nobody drives around Scotland um, in winter. So close the museums, but then open them seven days a week from the beginning of April to mid-October or something like that, because that is when the tourists will come. And what is a word in Estonian that tourists tend to know first? It's solitude. Far too often on the museum, <laughs> it's not 
Tere Tulemast or Abatud. So um, that is what I hope can change. It's getting better in Tallinn. Marek, you will know, we've discussed this over the years. Um, when I've talked about the Tallinn card and, well, can one sell it on a Monday? Well, Tallinn is looking at this issue um, and there are many more things to do on a Monday. It would have been a challenge ten years ago um, when it's pouring with rain, what does a tourist do in Tallinn? Well, you couldn't say go to Roca al Mare because it was pouring with rain. You couldn't say, well, walk around the old town. Well, where could you go? And there was really nowhere to go. Still a major problem in Tartu. I think there is no you will agree. Um, a lot has to be done in Tartu on this and other places as well. Um, tourism is a seven day a week business. Um, and if we're in it, that's what we have to work. If we aren't prepared to work, seven days a week or adjust our timetables to what the tourists need, well then we shouldn't be in the tourist business. Uh, many museums have to present themselves more attractively. Um, they are businesses now as far as tourism is concerned. Um, we had this issue in Britain say 30, 40 years ago that museums were places where academics worked and 5% of the population were interested and the 95% of the population, well, it didn't matter if you didn't come. Well, that has all changed now. The museums have to serve a wide population. They have to serve children, they have to serve tourists. Uh, you have to make money, basically, from them. Well, there are still far too many museums in Estonia which are still in the mindset, the framework of 30, 40 years ago, um, where you don't feel welcome. Well, I won't name those museums in public. I did notice on the attendance list that one or two people have come from particular museums, which I think are weak in this respect. But of the positive ones, um, the Transport Museum uh, between Pova and Tartu, um, I say in my book, it's the best museum in Estonia, simply because it appeals to so many different people. Um, my, my sort of 65-year-olds love it, sitting in the stagecoach, and five-year-old children love it. So it really does appeal to a wide range of people. Um, the new Seaplane Harbour Museum here is excellent because that started from scratch, and people there and to work out and getting their grants, um, how to attract uh, different sorts of people. And there's a much smaller museum, the Palkondas, the art gallery in Biljandi. Um, I think that is attractive for anyone interested in painting. He's an interesting artist and he is effectively presented there. So there are museums that are doing this job very well. There are lots of others that are, are not. Um, Lee, I'm going on much too long. How, how, shall I shut up? <laughs> <laughs> well, just a very few minutes more, sorry. <laughs> you, you know this is a problem with me. <laughs> yes, um, now, um, texts, um, whether these are in brochures or in websites, um, it isn't good enough to write a text that appeals to Estonians and then translate it and hope it's suitable. Unfortunately, it is more complicated than that. Whether you're selling a hotel, a museum, even car hire, you have to think, now, how is this going to appeal to perhaps an English-speaking market? Ideally, you want different material for the British and for the Americans. But certainly, if you go through the different nationalities who come here, what is going to interest them is very different. What they need to know is going to be very different. And, I mean, those of you who deal with Sweden and Finland, there are so many links which you can stress. And, of course, the knowledge of Estonia in those two countries is much better. The Germans are interested in the manor houses, the influence they had here. When you talk to the Russians, well, I don't know if any of you actually use the word liberate. I hope not for what happened in 1944. But, obviously, the language about the history of Estonia has to be written in a different way from the language you would use for other nationalities. Um, and even between Britain and America, there are linguistic problems. So in preparing these texts, I mean, it's easier for Christina with the Regent Holidays brochure, well, quite specifically, whom do we want in Britain to attract? 
much more difficult for those of you with a hotel here, with an attraction, and there are these different audiences, but you have to remember they are very different, and I'm afraid it does require different texts on the website, and uh, that, therefore, well, obviously different translations for the language, but targeting the different markets. And there's one problem with um, British and American English that always occurs, and I always have to tease Eleanor about this in Tartu on the website. Of, I fear it's still there, is it, uh, Eleanor? Was when I last looked at the website. Um, there's a list of certified guides. Now, in British English, certified means seriously mentally ill, somebody who has to be kept in a mental hospital because they are too dangerous to themselves and to others. So I look through this Tartu website and see that Elena is certified till the year 2016, <laughs> others are certified until 2017, which in British English would mean that she's possibly going to be allowed out of hospital in 2015, <laughs> something like that. So, um, you know, you do, and you know with Estonian and Finnish that there are words which are rude in one language and polite in another or different meanings and we have that issue with a lot of British and American phrases so you do have to choose words that are neutral in both British English and in um, American English important on the, the texts. Um, the souvenirs not much you can do about that but obviously I'm disappointed at seeing Russian souvenirs in Tallinn. There seems to be a fairly recent problem. Um, I don't know who is buying them. I mean, Russian tourists presumably aren't buying them. The Finns who come here presumably have been to St. Petersburg or go. Um, so I don't know why they want matroshkas or who is buying matroshkas. But just walking down Peak and Lai last night, I was thinking now there are too many Russian souvenirs in the shops. Uh, I want to see sort of Esti Kesitu on every shop window um, and you have a lot genuinely to sell. I mean there are plenty of countries that have nothing to sell in the way of souvenirs and they are artificial but you have the wood, you have the glass, you have the fabrics, you have everything at which you can sell from sort of 50 cents up to 500 euros. So I really do hope that um, more is made of that um, as an aspect really of coming to Estonia that uh, this is a genuine market and not uh, an artificial one and I hope just in Tallinn which still attracts of course the majority of tourists they are presented with more of an Estonian face. Also Lithuanian souvenirs, I mean a lot of amber coming to <coughs> Tallinn. Well amber is a Lithuanian or a Kaliningrad product, it has nothing to do with Estonia so I'm sad that it's here. Um, I would like it to be in other places to which it genuinely belongs and there's so many things in Estonia in glass, the Latvians and Lithuanians don't produce that much. Um, juniper, of course, is very much an Estonian product. So plenty of things that you should be selling here um, and aren't. Uh, and there could be sort of more on that. Well, we can be optimistic. It's been a good sort of 20 years of cooperation between um, Britain and Estonia. Uh, the tour operators who have started in Britain have tended to stay and are still promoting Estonia. Um, I don't think any British tour operator has gone bankrupt and left debts here. I'm not aware of any major dispute between British tour operators and Estonian ground handlers, so that's all very positive. Um, with Christina and Lena we were talking about complaints last night and there have been very few amongst tourists coming to Estonia. We talked about other countries where there have been many complaints and the difficulty that uh, Christina the tour operators have in Britain in resolving them, well that isn't an issue um, in uh, tourists coming to Estonia. So the real challenge is the one that I sort of took up with my book um, when it first came out 15 years ago in persuading people to look at Estonia as one country and as a destination that you should come to on its own. Um, in a way, I'm happy that my publisher has supported this idea, and so the book comes out every few years, and this means I don't actually have competition 
in English for a book just on Estonia. Lots of publishers, of course, have books on the three countries or on the surrounding areas. But I have to admit to failure in that if I bring groups here or discussing tourism, that there are still far too many people who will come to the three countries or perhaps go to Finland and Sweden and come here who still have this concept of Estonia as a Baltic province, as it were, and not a serious country in its own right. So that is the challenge for all of us, that people must stay longer here and on that basis um, will give you more business and will present Estonia as a country and not just as a province. Well, sorry, Lena, I've talked much too long. Apologies. So I'll, I will shut up now and stop. No, we know that we have taken this into, into consideration. <laughs> but um, thank you, Neil. Now we know why uh, English people are afraid to go to Tartu, because, Elina, you are certified. Yes. <laughs> and probably, probably people who live in Saatse uh, uh, are going to wonder why all these uh, masses of tourists exactly. are pouring into the village. Uh, I know, Neil, that you are, um, you are here now and you are, are more and more used to Estonian way of life, but have you noticed anything that's really positively surprising? I mean, during the, the last maybe two or three years, is it the attitude in, in how people kind of how people, how people um, kind of... Um well, my message yeah. has been that the positively surprising started very early. I say in my book that it started in 1994 and has been a sort of continuous process since then. And still, of course, people find this hard to believe that they can go to or small parts of the island and find speak people speaking adequate English. The message is perhaps still to get across is um, in some ways you will be surprised but now you shouldn't be surprised. You should take it for granted that everybody speaks English. If we go to Holland or to Belgium, a lot of other places, um, smaller countries, say Norway, Sweden, not so much France or Germany, we just assume that everybody speaks English. Um, but people coming here are still surprised, um, and they shouldn't be surprised. Well, <laughs> uh, um, of course, the president has said several times, this is a normal country. Well, it's a little difficult to use that phrase in holiday material, because you think, well, if it's normal, is there any point in going on holiday there? But you want the reassurance of a normal country. Uses the euro now. Everybody speaks English. Um, you can have a, a Chinese meal or an Indian meal or an Italian meal. I suppose the diversity of food now um, is something I could stress. And also perhaps of recent developments is the promotion of Estonian food. I think perhaps in the mid-90s there was never be a reaction to Soviet food and so the feeling was that, well, there must be French, Indian, all sorts of different food here because Estonia's never had it. And it's what's needed. Well, now Estonia has the confidence to say, well, you should actually eat Estonian food if you come here. And more and more restaurants are switching to serving Estonian food. And certainly my book will have to have more about, well, Estonian food specifically and these restaurants that are serving it. Still nice to have a Korean meal in Balgada. <laughs> <laughs> Kas kellegil on veel praegu küsimusi? Võtke siis Neil ka kohvipausel sabast kinni. Kell kaks võtab siin samas üle... Ma unustasin ühe väga tähtsa asja enne, kui ma lähen edasi. Suur tänu, Neil!